get started. No. What the on off off. Okay. So today is going to be our second day of talking about the alignment of two 3D surfaces to each other. And um, I'll review what this topic is about and then we will jump into today's uh, section on it. So, um, just as a reminder, we are collecting 3D surface data from a, one of these relatively expensive and exotic sensors such as radar, sonar, or laser radar, or a multi-camera system. And <clears throat> what I've told you is that one of the driving technologies that makes this data useful for a lot of applications is the alignment of, sur of a surface from one scan from this sensor to a surface gathered from another scan. And basically this thing, this technology is useful for a bunch of different applications. If you can do so, you can build 3D models of objects and 3D models of the world by taking multiple snapshots and piecing them together. You can locate yourself in a map by taking a 3D scan all around you and aligning that to a much larger map. And you can verify that you have properly detected objects that you think you have detected in a big 3D scan of an extended environment. So aligning scans are useful. And what I told you last time is I basically did my usual spiel of giving you a recipe for how to solve this alignment problem. And in particular, I told you that you basically need four things. One is the two different meshes that you're going to align to each other. And those are basically represented by sets of 3D points, A1, A2, A3, and so on, B1, B2, B3, and so on, and by edges that connect adjacent points to each other. A transformation model is a function that takes 3D coordinates and maps them to other 3D coordinates. It's governed, its behavior is governed by a set of parameters that uh, is, depends on what the transformation model is. I'm going to call that theta. So you map A sub K to a new A sub K. So this transforms the geometry of this A mesh, I call this the moving mesh, to some new configuration or new alignment of the moving mesh. So you need a metric, that's the third thing, which is a function that takes two meshes as an input and spits out a number that is large if they're not aligned with each other very well and small if they are aligned with each other very well. And what it's going to do is evaluate whether your transformation of A via the transformation governed by parameters theta seems to align well with B, which I said was the fixed mesh, which isn't moving around at all. <laughs> Excuse me. And finally, given that you have all of these pieces of information, an optimizer is a numerical scheme or a numerical routine that finds values for these transformation parameters theta that minimize M. So in other words, they if it's a rigid body transformation as we talked about last week, and A is my left hand and B is my right hand, then what's going to happen is that the optimizer is going to propose new theta, each of which corresponds to a different transformation of my left hand. And for each one of those, it's going to evaluate the goodness of fit of that particular transformation. So this alignment, probably not very good, will give a large value for M. This alignment is pretty good and gives a low value for M. And I think that I alluded to the idea that really the intellectual meat of this problem or the real heavy lifting for you as an engineer is really in this transformation model and M. So M is supposed to be this function, it's a metric that basically quantifies your intuitive notion or your semantic notion of what it means to be a well-aligned pair of surfaces for your particular application that you are programming for. Last time, the transformation models that we considered were rigid, which is to say all they did was translated and rotated the moving mesh A instead of stretching, compressing, squishing, deforming, uh, twisting the local locations on that moving mesh. And today, as you might uh, guess, we're doing the opposite. We're assuming that it is possible to treat the moving mesh A as though it is made of some kind of a rubbery material that you can bend and twist and compress and stretch. Now, one thing you might be considering is, hmm, 
all the applications that we've talked about thus far, it's unclear why I would want to deform one mesh to make it match the other. If I have one object, such as this table, and I take multiple scans of it from different points of view, what I'm basically doing in between points of view is rotating and translating the data set. So I'm not actually, in any realistic sense, squishing or compressing or twisting or pulling on the table. So our image of the table should not be a squished or compressed or twisted version from, time, from the second time point compared to the first time point. So let me just go through some of the applications or why you would care about the non-rigid transformation case. <laughs> Imagine that we have two surfaces that actually come from two different instances of the same type of object. So here what I mean is that a type of object might be faces. And two different instances of that object might be my face and your face. A type of object might be a femur, which is the big bone uh, that goes from your hip to your knee. You notice that there's the ball part of the ball and socket part of your hip joint up there, and this is where it connects to your knee. So the, gen the, the type of object might be femur, and individual instances of that object might be my femur and Joe Bob's femur. So uh, it, it can be useful in medical or scientific applications to find correspondences or find mappings between one of these biological objects and another. And just to give one example, imagine that instead of it being my femur and your femur, it's my femur and some primate's femur. And what we want to do is determine how exactly it happened that some set of genetic mutations that happened over the course of evolution led to a primate's femur being having a particular shape to it and ending up with something that looks like my femur. It's called the genotype-phenotype problem. So if we do that and we find correspondences between the primate femur and the human femur, then we can actually quantitatively describe how femurs changed over the course of evolution and relate them to things like genetics. And there are many, many other examples where what you might want to do is actually find mappings between pairs of biological instances where, each inst where all of the instances belong into some class like femurs or humerus bones or skulls, for example. So, and just as one concrete example, well, yeah, as one concrete example of this, there was a project that Dr. Amenta in the computer science department led called Evolutionary Morphing, where she had a big set of monkey skulls and basically found deformable mappings between each one and each one to try to visualize the course of skull change over the course of evolution. <laughs> no two individual monkeys should be expected to have exactly the same geometry of skulls. So that's why in order to map them to each other, we need to think about stretching or compressing or twisting or turning any individual feature on it, such as the eye sockets or the jaw jawline. Kind of along the same idea is imagine if you have two surfaces of exactly the same object, but you take the images at two different times. And so let's stick with our uh, femur example, where I'm an elderly individual with uh, osteoarthritis, let's say. And what the arthritis has done over time is that it has uh, reduced the amount of cartilage that is protecting my bones from grinding against each other. And in fact, over time, what it's done is it's taken that cartilage to zero, so my bones are grinding against each other. And in fact, the ball part of my ball, the socket joint in my hip, is grinding against my pelvic bone. <clears throat> so what you can do over time, or what you can consider doing over time if you are an orthopedist, is actually evaluate the degree to which this person's ball and socket joint in their hip is deteriorating. To do so, you can take one scan of the femur at one time, wait a while, and take another scan of the femur, and then take another scan of the femur, and then take another scan of the femur. So if you have just two time points, say from 2005 and 2010, then you'll have a femur from 2005 and a femur from 2010. 
And the femur in 2010 might be a deformed version of the same object. In other words, they, they, probably the best way to relate them to each other is not via just a translation and a rotation, but also some kind of a deformation of the ball part of the uh, bone. So in order to evaluate exactly how much the ball part of the bone has deteriorated, you can imagine doing a deformable mapping of one to the other. And you can actually quantify how much you have to deform the 2005 healthy femur in order to end up with a bone that looks like the sick 2010 femur. And the examples of this, especially in the medical world, are just abundant. So in any kind of neurological disorder like um, multiple sclerosis, for example, the, your clinician who is taking care of you will probably want to get an MRI done of your brain once every so often, maybe once every year, once every two years, to evaluate the effects of treatments on the brain. And what you can do from MRI is get, is get surfaces, get basically a 3D surfaces, that correspond to individual components of the brain. And what you hope is that over time, as you're treated for your multiple sclerosis, these surfaces in the brain stay stable or they get better over time. So in some parts of the brain, uh, structures are big and kind of puffy if they're healthy, and they're kind of shriveled up like a raisin if they're not healthy. So what you might want to do is evaluate whether the surfaces on the in the brain are changing over time based on multiple MRIs. And to do that, you can take a surface from the first MRI and deformably map it to the second MRI to see how much it has changed over time. And you can take multiple sclerosis out of what I just said and replace it with your disease of choice. And it's a relevant medical, uh, biomedical research problem. Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, um, autism, schizophrenia, you name it. So uh, kind of a more practical engineering level application of this is fitting a generic model to a specific instance. So let's say that I build a generic model of a human face. And you know an artist can do this. Uh, a sculptor can do this by just simply making a 3D surface that has rough locations of eyes, nose, mouth, and so on. And this artist or the sculptor can actually manually label what parts of the surface are the eye sockets, what parts of the nose, where the septum is, and so on. So then, given a new surface that is an instance of an actual individual human being's face, you can deformably match the generic surface to the individual one in order to label the individual's one with the locations of that person's eyes, nose, and mouth. So you wouldn't expect that the locations of the eyes, the shape of the nose, the contours of the mouth, and so on, would exactly match between the person that was made up by a sculptor and an, any an, actual individual human being. So in order to match all those features quite well, what you need to do is basically stretch the eyes so that they're farther apart from each other, inflate the nose if the person has a kind of a Roman nose, those kinds of things. Make, make the lips more puffy or less, depending on how big their lips are, and so on. <clears throat> and um, there was a period of time in biometrics where we were all told that uh, large companies were all going to install 3D face scanners as, a, um, as an authentication technology. That hasn't really happened, but you can imagine this being a technology for authenticating that someone who comes to the front door is actually who they say they are by using the shape of the face as a, um, as a way to authenticate themselves. And you can use this kind of technology to actually verify that someone who says that they're John Smith has the face of John Smith. Yeah? I have a question. Um, I see on your slides and in the ITK manual is registration. What exactly does that mean in the context right, of this process? It's a good terminological question. So, um, uh, and it's an abuse, it's abused terminology. So what I mean is that some people you talk to, when they use the word alignment, what they're referring to is just rigid alignment. So what we talked about on Monday, just rotating and translating. And registration is referred to, is used to refer to either 
rigid or non-rigid geometric transformations. I use those terms interchangeably. So anytime you see the word alignment in the slides, you can substitute it for registration, and it's fine. Also, if you keep going, if you're interested in this area and you want to do research in it, you might see the word spatial normalization. Okay, So that is specifically the deformable case. I tend to not use that terminology because I think it's confusing. But, um, but spatial normalization basically means deformable alignment of two things to each other. Um, and then mapping is the other term, which basically refers to the fact that you are mapping geometric coordinates in 3D to geometric coordinates in 3D. So thanks for that. I, should, I'm, I think I'm going to make a slide that actually has, because one of the terrible things about this field is our abuse of lingo. So I like to put those kinds of pieces of information in my slides. Any other questions? OK. So another reason, and this is a little bit more, um, a little bit more esoteric, but another reason why deformable alignment, aka deformable registration, is a useful thing for you to consider is that sometimes sensor errors are nonlinear. And by that I mean if I take two 3D scans of this table from different points of view, you would hope that all of the points in the 3D world that lie on the table uh, form a plane because the table is planar. But realistically speaking, if your 3D sensor is not very well calibrated, which a lot of them aren't, what you will end up with is not a plane of points, but a slightly curved parabolic shaped surface. It has to do with the fact that, well, it has to do with any number of different artifacts, some of which we talked about last week. And so to rectify the 3D data, you can do what's called calibration, where you take a 3D scan of something where you know the exact distance between the sensor and the thing that you're scanning. And if you know that that thing that you're scanning is planar, and the data set that you actually get out is curved, then you can apply a transformation that's deformable, that deforms that curved surface back into a plane. So then you can apply that transformation to all the data that you get out of the scanner at future time points, no matter what you're scanning. So, um, and this is, sometimes this is the kind of pre-processing that actually goes, that takes place on board your sensor before you even get your own data out of it. So this is a common, uh, this is a common motif in both 3D sensing and uh, medical imaging devices that you think that the very simple mechanical operation of, of detecting the locations of 3D points is all that's happening on the sensor when really it's not. You get, the sensor gets the 3D points, modifies them to some degree, and then gives you the output. So this is the kind of thing that might be that might fall into that category of pre-processing that happens before you get the data. So um, here's a, you know, a recipe for, it's not the only recipe, but it's one recipe for how to do deformable surface-to-surface -surface alignment. Remember that we start with a moving mesh, A, and a fixed mesh, B, where each one is described in terms of the coordinates of the points on the surface in 3D. So one recipe is to start by specifying a set of control points, C, C1 through K, that reside on A. So what we're going to do then is first decide how to move the control points so that the corresponding locations, the locations on A that correspond to C1, C2, C3, and so on, are moved to be in the correct positions on B. So if C1 is the position of the left eyeball in the face, in one face scan, um, and C2 is the position of the right eyeball, then basically we will translate the control points so that the left eyeball on the moving mesh lines up with the left eyeball on the fixed one. So we're going to take this isolated set of points and move them, translate them independently of each other. They can be completely separate, unrelated transformations across the different control points. We're going to move each one of them individually so that they align up with where they should be on that fixed mesh B. Then what we're going to do is use interpolation, which we kind of grazed the surface of in a previous lecture. 
but we're going to use interpolation, which is a way to fill in the transformation values in between those control points. So we're going to define the transformation in terms of the translations of all the control points and then fill in the gaps. So then if you're thinking about the general formulation of mesh-to-mesh -mesh alignment, uh, I, what I told you is that the behavior of each transformation is governed by a vector of parameters theta. Well, here, basically the vector of parameters is going to be the, translation, the translations of each one of the control points. So it's going to be a three vector that gives you the change in x, y, and z for each one of the control points. So it'll be delta c1, delta c2, delta c3, if you will. And then interpolation fills in the rest. But I don't want to make it sound like interpolation is kind of an automatic thing because you have to decide how to do that too. Here's an example. I have two 3D surfaces, one of which looks a lot like a circle, and the other one of which looks kind of like that lumpy uh, brown thing. And I have decided, never mind how I've decided because we'll talk about that later, but I have decided that uh, I want to define one, two, three, four, five control points, which are shown in green, and I want to transform the black circle so that it lines up well with the brown contour. And furthermore, never mind how I figured out what this translation is, but let's just say manually I, just, I figured out what the transformation ought to be. Uh, and in particular, I've decided that this green point corresponds to this location. This green point, you can't even see the arrow because they're so well lined up already. Uh, this green point goes out that way and so on. So then what I can do is basically use those control point translations to define how the transformation works going from black to brown. And interpolation, as I've said, fills in the gaps. So that in the end, we get a transformation between black and brown that looks like so. Now, the interesting thing about mesh-to-mesh -mesh deformable alignment using control points is that um, basically the translation of the control points defines what the transformation is across the entire ambient space. So when I say ambient space, I mean that in some sense every molecule of every location in the 3D world is thought of as being transformed in some way. It's not just that you have a surface sitting in a vacuum and the only thing that gets pushed and tugged and pulled on is the surfaces in the vacuum. It's more like you have surfaces embedded in jello. And the, not only is the surface being tugged and pulled, but the jello is going along with it. So another way to say this is that the motion of the control points induces a transformation of the entire underlying space. And this figure is trying to demonstrate that. So each of these colored dots is one point in the background or ambient space, the jello. And the transformation, as I've described it, induces the transformation that's suggested to here, where every one of the purple dots here is moved to be one of the purple dots here in a way that you should be able to see. Now, mapping it out in this way, it should be clear on some level what that transformation is doing. If you remember, all the control points except for the ones that were already lined up pretty well pulled the black circle outward in an outward direction, right? So in some sense, the underlying ambient space is being stretched apart from the middle towards the outward. And that should be clear if you look at all these dots here. So there used to be pretty much no space in between the dots. And here in the middle, there's more of a space. It's more stretched out in this direction. Interestingly, the points are still pretty compressed over here, but that's OK because basically there is uh, no um, requirement on our part that anything else happen besides pushing the black circle out so that it fit the brown contour. So this gives you a sense of what control points can do for you. Control points plus an interpolation scheme is that they can take uh, the entire underlying space and transform it in a deformable way. Does this make sense? Any questions? Okay, good. So, um, as you can imagine, this general scheme begs a couple of real basic questions. First of all, where are these control points coming from? 
Where do I put them? There are basically two ways to think about these control points and where you're going to put them. The first is manually. So I described a little bit about the uh, monkey skull deformable mapping project. Well, those, all of those uh, control points were placed manually by uh, monkey paleontologists who know sort of where the anatomical positions of various locations of interest on the monkey skull are. So there's a human operator who has a PhD in some biological science, and that person is marking the moving mesh with where the positions are of uh, points of interest in some sense. And it's known in terms of the scientific application domain that the control, that the control point I click on this monkey skull really should correspond to a, the corresponding location of, a, of, the, of that point on a different monkey skull. So um, you can also do this automatically. So we talked about detecting interesting points um, in photographs. And we even talked last time, or no, two times ago, Friday, a little bit, about um, classifying each point on a mesh in terms of, uh, oh no, that was last time. That was Monday. I showed a, a, an image of the bunny model where each point has been labeled in terms of how well it constrains a geometric transformation. You can think about the highly constraining points as being interesting points on the bunny. And there's other schemes that you can use for identifying points on your 3D surfaces that are interesting in some sense that you need to define as the engineer. So you can use that for automatically selecting a discrete kind of small set of points on your two surfaces that look like they ought to be aligned to each other, and these are going to be your control points. You can also be a little bit more brute force by uniformly sampling mesh vertices on the surface and moving each one of the mesh vertices as though they are special control points in some way. And some ideas for how to pick interesting points on the surfaces are things like high curvature areas or areas where some feature that you extract from the surface takes on some definitive value. So then the next thing you need to determine is, first of all, okay, let's say you have control points. You know where they are on your, on your fixed and moving surfaces. You have to decide how to move them from how to translate each one of them so that they align well with the other surface. Now, in the monkey skulls case, that was easy, right? Because what I told you is that there are some anatomical locations that are shared across every monkey. And if I click on the uh, outer extent of the right eye socket, I know exactly how to translate that so that it aligns up properly with the outer left eye socket of the next monkey. But now, if I use more automated techniques, there, there might be control points that do match up well with specific locations on the other object in that kind of right eye socket goes to right eye socket way, or maybe not. So we need to figure out, in the, in the more automated case, how to, how to decide how to translate each one, of the, um, each one of the control points on the moving surface. So one idea comes from ICP, which is to say, now this is the same exact figure I showed last time, but now imagine that instead of these being densely packed in surface vertices, they're actually control points that are sparsely spread out. But well, what we can do is basically move each one of our control points so that it aligns well with the closest point on the other surface. So instead of, and in fact what it usually does, what, what ICP does in the rigid case is it determines what the ideal transformation or what the ideal translation should be of every vertex on the moving mesh and then in some way uh, tries to find a compromise that is basically a rigid transformation that takes all of those individual translations into account. I didn't present it that way on Monday, but that's another way to think about what ICP is doing. The first point wants to go over here. The second point wants to do something slightly different. The third one wants to do something entirely different. And so the rigid body transformation that you estimate based on these guys is in some sense a, a uh, compromise between all of those sort of competing different translations. Well here, since we have the deformable case, 
You don't need to do any compromise. You can just decide that every surface uh, control point moves to the position of the nearest vertex on the other mesh. And then you interpolate the transformation in between. Better yet, you can use some of those ICP++ ideas that I talked about last time, such as moving control points to the closest plane on the other surface instead of the closest point to deal with differences in how, those, how that surface was discreetly sampled twice. Now, um, and yet another idea, which you will be thinking about quite a bit for homework two, comes from an algorithm that's very popular and very practical called robust point matching. What it does is instead of having each control point identify a single location on the fixed mesh where it wants to move to, it ponders the possibility of this control point uh, being translated to this one, this one, this one, this one, and so on for all possible other for all possible vertex positions on the fixed mesh. And what it does is it tries to find a compromise between all of those. And in particular what it does is it takes a weighted average of all of the possible places where it could go where the weighting is proportional to how far they are away from the original point. So the thickness of the line here corresponds to the weighting. So since this control point is very close to this vertex, it weights this translation very highly. Since these two points are further away, it weights that one a little bit lower. And since this one is very far away, it's unlikely that this control point should get translated here. And so the weight of this one is low. So if you take a weighted average of all of these vertex positions or all these translations, then you'll end up with something that's a compromise between all of them. And it turns out that if you use this so-called soft correspondence idea, then you get something that seems to be pretty robust in practice for aligning two surfaces to each other, deformably. So it's called a soft correspondence technique because uh, hard correspondence, as you can think of, as the same idea except the weights are strictly either 0 or 1. And there's exactly one vertex on the fixed mesh that has a weighting of 1 and all the rest have 0. So that's hard or binary in the sense that there's no blending of multiple point positions to each other. Soft means that each possible correspondence, each putative correspondence, has a floating point number associated with it between 0 and 1. And you blend those together in a way that is usually referred to as soft. A closely related idea that is practical and relatively quick in practice is to take a pre-processing step that first takes your fixed mesh, which I didn't actually show, but the fixed mesh would be, uh, well, I didn't show it overlaid here, but imagine that the fixed mesh is shaped like this and that I embed this in an image space so that I basically think about this, each point on the fixed mesh as being a pixel in an image. So what I can do then is take that original image, which is kind of an image representation of my mesh, and I can transform it so that I have a new image where the pixel value at each position in this new image, the pixel value it takes is the distance from that pixel to the original surface, or actually uh, one over that. So here, bright pixels have a distance of zero from the fixed mesh, and black pixels have a value of, have a distance from the mesh, fixed mesh of very far. <coughs> and gray values are somewhere in the middle where they're not extremely close to the fixed mesh and they're not extremely far, they're somewhere in the middle. So then, what we're going to do to, do to do deformable alignment is take our moving mesh and plop it on top of this image and follow the gradient of the image. So what that's going to do is move each control point in the direction that most quickly reduces the distance to the fixed mesh. So you can imagine if, if you're a point right here and you're trying to figure out where you ought to go in order to get towards the fixed mesh, you'd want to move in that direction because that's the quickest way of getting from far away from the fixed mesh to close to. 
And this is a practical thing because all you have to do in order to figure out how to transform every control point is do a bunch of lookups in an image. Yeah? Can you explain how you build this distance mapping? Uh, so what if the pixel IJ comes from? Right, so actually in, uh, it's good you ask because in ITK there is a filter that does exactly this for you. And um, there's algorithms to do it quickly. So the input to those algorithms is a binary image where each pixel in the image is, takes a value of 0 if it corresponds to a location that's not on your fixed mesh of interest. And it takes a value of, excuse me, not 0, 1, say, if it corresponds to a position that's on your fixed mesh of interest. So your first step is going to be to take your fixed mesh and more or less rasterize it into an image format. And there's various ways you can do that. So then what this algorithm is going to do, it's called the uh, Danielson Distance Map Filter or something like that. Danielson is the name of the algorithm, anyway. So what it's going to do is start with this binary representation of your surface <coughs> and do a set of passes. You can think about it. It does it smarter than this, but you can think about it as in the first pass, it starts by um, setting the output image values to zero distance for every pixel that's on the surface. The next pass, it takes all the pixels that are adjacent to those zero pixels and sets them to one. So instead of being zero distance away, it's one distance away. The next pass, it takes the pixels that are one distance away, and the ones adjacent to those are two distance away, and so on and so on and so on. So it kind of Raster, it scans through the image repeatedly, building up this, um, this distance map in incrementally. This is a variant of that is also referred to as a grass fire transform, which is to say if your fixed mesh were on fire, how long would it take some other pixel to catch on fire? And it basically does that by growing, uh, by growing the surface outward in some sense. Does that make sense? Uh, any other questions about this? I actually use this class when I write programs uh, for uh, sometimes in ITK. It's pretty pretty fast and useful. Okay, so uh, administrative business. There's a midterm on Monday. Self-explanatory. Uh, another thing is that Jing and I looked on SmartSite, and it looks like only eight people. We, we could only find eight homework ones, which makes me, makes me think that either a lot of people are taking the 20-point cut and turning it in a week late, or we are missing something. So I'm worried about the latter possibility. So can you raise your hand if you have, if you have turned it in on, uh, you have, if you have turned in homework one. So one, two, three, four out of... You I talked to. Are you auditing? No. Okay. Okay. One, two. So four out of about eight. Okay. So that's about half. So that's okay. I mean, there's nothing wrong with turning it in with the penalty, but I just was deathly nervous that you think you turned in your homework assignment and you actually didn't, and you're going to get a zero and freak out. So. Um, I am going to assume that you that if I can't find it on Smart Site in the Dropbox, then you have not turned it in. But obviously, it goes without saying that if you get your score back and it's zero and you turn it in, then you you come talk to me. Okay, well, then that's okay. Then that means that I'm not missing something. Um, that said, homework two is available, so start early as usual. <laughs> Uh, a couple of, un, well, not unrelated completely, but unrelated to what you're going to be graded on. Um, there's going to be a pretty neat lecture today on surface deformation techniques for computer graphics. It's at 4 o'clock in Math Sciences, uh, the Math Sciences Auditorium, which is Math Sciences 1147. And it has to do with these curious things called conformal mappings and uh, harmonic mappings which are ways of deforming one surface to another so that you preserve various properties of the surface across as you deform it. And in particular, if you have three points on a surface and you do a conformal mapping, the angle that those three points make is preserved. 
and there's a big, rich mathematical question of how exactly you calculate those and what their properties are. In the other, and especially if you're interested in computer graphics, this is sort of like the emphasis is going to be at how those get applied to computer graphics. Second unrelated um, uh, um, announcement is that I'm giving neurology grand rounds tomorrow at the Medical Center in Sacramento at the Ellison Building, also known as the Ambulatory Care Center. So if you want to, I basically straddle the computer science and neuroscience sides of the world. So if you wanted to learn more about the medical side, and especially how you can apply uh, image processing techniques to really serious medical problems, then come to Sacramento. The audience is more um, uh, sort of clinicians and medical students and residents and interns and so on. But it might be fun for you to hear about real world why the stuff you're learning here is, is quite useful. Any questions about these? Yes? And now, so it's one to two. <coughs> Anything else? Okay. So um, let's see. Sort of, there were three questions that were begged by my proposition that we pick a set of control points, translate each one independently, and interpolate the transformation in between. We've talked about the first one and the second one, which is. What are these control points, and how do you translate them? So now we have that third problem, which is how do you fill in the transformation in between your control point translations? So uh, like we talked about, the, each of the control point translations, actually the set of all of them put together, uh, induces a motion of every position in the k-dimensional space. So the entire, all of 3D can be thought of as being transformed by this transformation. It's a dense mapping from the entire k-dimensional space to itself. And so you can think of it in the continuous domain as being a function that maps all of 3D to all of 3D. And so if you're sitting around and you're trying to figure out uh, kind of on paper what properties you want this dense mapping to, uh, to have, there are a couple of them that you can think of. The first is differentiability. Which is to say, if I have this function t that transforms 3D to 3D, the derivative of t of, of d up to some, uh, sorry, the derivative of t up to some order should exist everywhere. So this is basically saying that the mapping from one from one 3D space to another should not have big cusps in it or serious discontinuities. It should be smooth. The mapping. You, one other uh, desirable property is that you might want it to be as smooth as possible, which is to say that it minimizes the curvature, which is basically the second derivative of the mapping with respect to space. So given the choice between a mapping that tugs and pulls and squishes a little bit and one that tugs and pulls and squishes a lot, it might be more intuitive to pick the one that tugs and pulls and squishes a little bit. <coughs> if it's the case that both of them align the control points equally well. Okay? You also want no topological changes. So if this were 2D, I would not want a transformation from, from one plane to another that rolls up the plane into a burrito-shaped thing and makes the two ends uh, line up with each other. I also would not want to punch holes in the plane and have a big hole open up where the stuff in the interior of the hole is not really well mapped from one surface to another. And also invertibility. If you have, well, think of two corners of the plane. If two corners of the plane map to the middle of the plane, then you can't really go backwards. You can map from one surface to another, but not backwards, because you don't know if a point in the middle of the other plane goes to one corner or the other. So these are all desirable mathematical properties, differentiability, Topological consistency and invertibility are some. A diffeomorphism is currently the gold standard for how to do something reasonable with these space-to-space uh, -space mappings. It's one-to-one, -one, uh, onto, smoothly differentiable, and also its inverse is smoothly differentiable. So hopefully from your memory of calculus, you remember what all of these terms mean. Uh, basically means that uh, if you put all these together, the first two mean that 
you know, every point in the first 3D space is mapped to some other point in the other 3D space. The second one means that for every point in the other 3D space, there exists a point in the first 3D space that maps onto it. Uh, put those two together, it means that all points in both spaces are accounted for in terms of being mapped from one space to the other. The differentiability gets at those uh, gets at those problems I was talking about in terms of holes opening up and cusps and uh, quick discontinuities developing in your mapping from one surface to another. So I told you that, that using control points is basically only one recipe for getting a deformable mapping, but it is one. And if you set your interpolation scheme properly, you can actually get a, a diffeomorphic mapping just by using these control points with the proper interpolation. <coughs> and you should see that this mapping is more, is, looks like a diffeomorphism. It's spatially smooth. There are no serious holes that open up into it. This is probably not too great in that there's a big gap in between the surfaces, but it wouldn't be a stretch for you to figure out where a point here should get mapped to in the original space. It doesn't fold over onto itself. There's no sharp discontinuities. You get the idea. And another approach is called ambient space-based, where we say forget about control points, and we actually discretize the entire ambient space. So for all of 3D within a volume, we actually separately solve for a translation of each point inside the jello, or every single position inside the 3D space. So this point might go here, and this point might go here, and so on. And if you do that properly, you get a diffeomorphic mapping, but it takes almost forever to do because there are so many parameters to estimate. <clears throat> so here's the math of how to use a control point-based model. Here's our transformation T. And what we're going to do for some other point A inside the ambient space somewhere, we're going to move it um, by consulting all of the other all of the control points that we've defined. So as you can see here, there's a sum over J. Just look at this part. There's a sum over J where J indexes the control points. So there's going to be one term in this sum for every control point. And uh, well, this whole thing is going to be the term for the control points for each control point. And this delta CJ is going to be the translation of that control point CJ. So you've determined how to translate the control points, and those are these deltas. So this is basically a 3D vector that gives you change in X, change in Y, change in Z for CJ. So what we're going to do is consult each one of our control points and say, should I move this AK uh, in a way that is similar to, to, this, to the movement of CJ or not? And in fact, what we're going to do is take a weighted sum where if we really want to move AK in the same way that CJ was moved, then we, weight, then we have a high weight in this weighted sum and opposite if we want a low weight. And simply put, what we're going to do is say that points that are nearby CJ get moved like CJ gets moved. So D is the distance in Euclidean space between AK and CJ. And F is what's called the weighting function. So what F tries to do is make the weighting of CJ on AK high if they're close to each other and low if, it's, if they're further away. Does this make sense? OK. Now, it turns out that the design of F makes all the difference in terms of the behavior of your mapping from one space to another. <coughs> And in fact, you can get different versions of transformations depending on how you pick that weighting function. One of the most popular and widely used um, weighting functions is called the thin plate spline weighting function. We talked about splines, but this is a different application of it to mapping one entire surface to another. But there, this F is basically R squared log R is how you weight uh, each control point based on the distance r. And it turns out that if you do the math, you can find that using this uh, 
using this weighting function minimizes what's called the so-called bending energy, which is basically the sum of squares of second derivatives of the mapping across the entire space. So it has a known property that makes it kind of smooth and well-behaved. But there are other ways to do it too. Uh, I'm out of time, but you can look at this other way to do it. Um, now just to summarize, for non-rigid registration alignment, what you need to do is to specify where your control points are, decide how to translate those control points, and then decide how to fill in the motion in between using something like thin plate splines. Any last minute questions about this? Okay, great. See you Friday. <laughs>